So it's so good to be uh, good to be back this week again. Um, you know, thank you all for, for joining me. It really makes my heart light up, you know, to spend this time with you all. I have a uh, couple of quick announcements. Uh, next Sunday evening, which I believe will be the 10th, um, I won't be teaching uh, here at 7 p.m., but I will be teaching at noon on Sunday, and it'll be a live stream. It's hosted, um, I think it's uh, the name of the group is Living From Love, and there's a uh, link to it on my website. It'll be a two-hour talk on doing shadow work. And so uh, please visit my website, uh, go to the events page, and there should be details uh, for tuning in. It's it's free, and I believe it's interactive as well. And so, so that's uh, this coming Sunday at noon. Also, I want to um, invite everyone to my uh, Wednesday night meditation class at 7 p.m. Uh, Mountain Standard Time. Um, and it's a wonderful time. I've been having a really nice time connecting with individuals and sharing in this space of meditation and this transmission together. And so during that time, we uh, I don't do any question and answer. We just, you know, basically we come together and I give a very short, uh, very short meditation instructions and then offer a guided meditation for the rest of the hour. Details are on my website for that as well. I want to thank everyone for the donations and the generosity that helps uh, keep this uh, keep this satsang uh, going on and available to everyone. I want to do a big thank you to Chad up in uh, Carbondale, to Bryce, uh, to Lee Jones, to Chris, um, Shauna. Thank you all so much uh, for your donations. And for any of those of you I missed, uh, thank you uh, truly. It's very uh, helpful to support the Dharma with your generosity. So if anyone's interested in making a donation, you can visit my website and there's a donate link there, uh, craigholiday.com. Thank you all so much. I think that's all of the, uh, <laughs> all of the uh, announcements. I do have a, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, trying to plan a, a meditation retreat uh, in San Diego. Uh, maybe at the end of April or May. We'll see if we can pull that off, if the stars align for that. Uh, if not, there'll be one for sure in uh, Durango this summer. And there's also some uh, some possibilities too as well. So uh, just uh, make sure you sign up for the newsletter for uh, details about all that. And so I thought we'd just take a moment and, and come inward. Now just to close our eyes, to feel our body. And just notice this quiet, this quiet presence that you are. This gentle space of divinity. Notice the silence that's here. The spaciousness. very space in which you hear the sound of my voice, the space in which thoughts come and go, sensations come and go. <clears throat> and I invite you just to breathe and feel. Experience what's here. Notice that what you are, when you feel into your heart, that what you are is fundamentally good. Fundamentally luminous. And so if you feel into your body, you're just noticing this gentle luminosity, this presence of peace, this stillness, And then, of course, you're also welcome you know, to call upon, to call upon God, to invite her into your body, into your form, 
to awaken you and fill you with light. You know, sometimes in life we get carried away with our thoughts, we get lost in our emotions. We lose touch with our innate divinity. And so I invite you to open to that quiet still point within you, a quiet space of divinity. And then from this space of divinity, you can call upon God, <clears throat> excuse me, call upon God and invite her into you. Say, Lord, will you bless me? Will you fill me with light, with love? Will you reconnect me with my peace, my truth? Sometimes life is confusing. Sometimes we get lost in our own pain or fear or aggression. Sometimes we're even lost in our shadow and we don't even know what's happening within us. And so we're inviting the intelligence of the universe to speak to us, to open, <laughs> open some doors inside, to shine the light, to show us what the truth is. And also to let us know clearly what is not the truth. You know, sometimes we're attached to that which is not the truth. And so when we come together in this space of satsang, it's a space of humility where we are willing to receive. We're real willing to open to a greater truth, a greater wisdom. A greater freedom than the collective norm, the collective insanity. So you can take a couple more deep, full belly breaths, just breathing. <clears throat> Excuse me. And just relaxing the body. And relaxing the heart, the belly, the pelvis, the legs, the feet, the arms, the hands. And just inviting the whole nervous system to calm down, to come into a place of peace, and to let go of that which you are attached to. And then simultaneously to wake up to your divinity. To wake up, to connect to that which is good, that which is luminous and divine about you. So you're just breathing and feeling. And saying yes. Yes to that which is good, that which is divine. And so from this space, I'm just going to invite you just to sit with a couple questions here. I'm going to speak a little bit about shadow tonight. But I thought we'd work experientially right now, just in this space of meditation. And so from this space of openness, from this space of awareness, I invite you to ask this question to your heart. to your unconsciousness as well. What do I know that I don't want to know? Is there anything within me that I'm hiding from the light of awareness? Is there any old pain which is buried deep within me. What do I know that I don't want to know? Are there aspects of myself 
my true nature that I'm cut off from. Because of anger, or violence, or greed, or rage. And so we're giving ourselves permission to be awake and to see that which is within us. So you're giving yourself permission to descend into the unconsciousness to help liberate it. through this act of seeing and loving. Liberation requires that we both see and respond with love, that which is within us. And so if there's anger, there's unresolved emotions, do you see them? Are you able to breathe, <laughs> acknowledge, oh, there's something within me, something less than spiritual. <laughs> That's a little bit of a joke. In the true space of awareness, the true space of compassion, everything is welcome. We don't ignore, we don't deny. The true space of silence, everything is embraced. We don't ignore. For this silence to deepen, for the truth to deepen within us, we must be open and receptive and see and feel and acknowledge everything within us. <clears throat> so another question to sit with in this space? Is there any place within me that I'm unnecessarily argumentative or judgmental? And so if you have a judge or an angry man or an angry woman within your consciousness, can you bring her forward? Can you soften there? Can you let her know? Let him know, I see you. I'm willing to love you. It's true that being awake is a shift in perspective. It's a shift out of ego and into a space of freedom, a space of wisdom, a space of compassion and love. A true freedom is absolutely inclusive. It doesn't condemn, it doesn't ignore, it doesn't deny. It fully acknowledges, it fully embraces. Another question to sit with, who do I need to forgive? Is there anyone within my consciousness, within my past, within my cellular memory <laughs> that I need to forgive. And I just let them come forward out of the unconsciousness. Let this old pain come forward to be liberated, to be met with love. Who do I need to forgive? Is there anyone floating around in my past? that I need to forgive. Are there any parts of myself, of my own consciousness, that I need to forgive, that I could forgive? <laughs> Are there any places where you fight with yourself, where you judge yourself, you condemn yourself? You attack yourself or make it wrong, yourself wrong for being human. Can you forgive the human in you? And so remember, in order to be awake 
in an abiding way. We can't be carrying around a heavy backpack of guilt, of anger, of judgment within ourselves. <laughs> we will trip over it. It will burden us. You're doing yourself a service. You're doing the world a service when you forgive others for their sins, their transgressions. And when you forgive yourself, And so you can just see these people from the past. You can see yourself in the mirror. Can you forgive yourself for being too big, too small, <laughs> for being too angry or grumpy or emotional or sensitive? Can you forgive yourself? The more you forgive yourself, the easier it is to forgive others. The more awake you are, the more you discover everything is within you. All of heaven and all of hell, all of the animal nature is within us all. If you're honest, if you're honest. So part of learning to meditate, part of being awake, Part of doing shadow work is <laughs> having what I call supreme honesty. By supreme, I mean the highest honesty, a willingness to see, to excavate, to look. What's within you? What's within you? If you don't bring it forward into the light, it will come back and haunt you. So another great question to sit with, with this space of inquiry and meditation. Do I love myself? Do I love myself? Do you love you? Are there places within you that you don't love? If so, this is not going to work on this path of awakening, <laughs> on this path of compassion. You cannot go forward without loving yourself deeply, completely, absolutely. So are there aspects of yourself that you do not love? That you do not love. It's okay to have a healthy sense of remorse. It's okay to admit <laughs> that you've made mistakes in the past that we could all do better. But do you fundamentally see and feel and experience your divinity, your goodness? So we're taking some deep, full belly breaths, just breathing in and out. And then of course, Another great question while we're doing this liberation work is, do I love my friends, my family? Do I love my enemies? I want to be clear here. Loving your enemies doesn't mean you need to sleep with them. It doesn't mean you need to live in the house with them. You can have boundaries and still love another. Can you see that they are a human being? They, like you, may be struggling at times. And so again, do I love my friends, my family, my enemies, the people on the other side of the political aisle, the people who go to a different church, the guy who cuts you off in traffic. The judgmental mother who says, hey, you're not doing a good job when you're parenting your children or <laughs> when you're taking your kids to school or whatever it is. There are people who try to shame you. Can you extend love to them? 
because you see that you are God. You see that you are free, free enough to love. And so I invite you just to take some deep, full belly breaths, just breathing in and breathing out, and just allowing these questions to unravel allowing the truth to come forward, whether it's in this moment or tonight, when you go to sleep or when you're driving down the road. Part of being awake is giving yourself permission to be awake fully to your divinity and also awake to the unconscious nature and to welcome the unconscious nature forward. Being willing to say, I see you. I'm willing to love you. I'm willing to forgive you <laughs> for being human. <laughs> I'm willing to forgive the past. But in order to forgive, we have to be willing to acknowledge first. Acknowledge first. And so if you like, you can open your eyes. You know, in order to be awake in the world, we must have integrity and honor. If we want to be awake in an abiding way, we must have integrity and honor. When we do shadow work, we deepen in our integrity and honor. Now, shadow work is a willingness to look at our unconsciousness. Now, a shadow is a thing, you know, within ourselves that we cannot see. A couple of weeks ago, <clears throat> uh, I offered a, a class and my daughter uh, came in and, uh, you know, she wanted to see what her dad did on <laughs> Sunday nights. So I let her come in and sit on my lap and say hi to everyone. And, and um, you know, as she walked out of the room and I was saying bye to her, I turned my head and I noticed that my, my hair was all sticking up in the back. You know, I had taken a shower earlier and I uh, had a little nap after the shower and my hair, you know, just got a little wild in the bed, you know. And so as I came in and I gave the broadcast, you know, my hair was kind of sticking up all over. And, and because it was in the back, I couldn't see it. I couldn't see it. You know, but some of the other people, you know, who were there that evening, they said, they looked, and they saw, oh, look, you know, Craig's hair is all messy and silly looking. And the people around us can see our shadow. The people around us are communicating to us often. They may say, you're speaking to me with a harsh tone. You don't make eye contact with me. It seems like you don't love me. You are unkind when you spoke to the uh, clerk at the store, whatever it is. So the world, you know, our children, our partners are giving us feedback all the time. If we ignore this feedback and say, oh, no, you don't understand. You don't understand. I, I didn't do that. If we ignore their feedback or deny it right away, there's a good chance we have a shadow there. You know, shadows can be maintained when there's an unwillingness to look at something. And sometimes we defend ourselves from the truth because we don't want to admit that we have anger within us or sadness or heartache or despair. We don't want to admit that we are addicted to, you know, this thing or that thing. We don't want to admit that we feel anxious and so we you know, grab our phones and just get lost in the Instagram or Facebook or whatever it is. We space out instead. But in order to be awake in the world, you have to be honest. Honest. When you're honest, it's easier to be awake. You start to liberate your karma, the old pain and old, old stuck karma, old stuck unconscious energy that's within you. If you don't do this liberating work, 
then you'll trip over it again and again and again. And so many people, they, uh, especially in this modern day spirituality, they're having the experience of awakening. And then they ask, why did my awakening not last? It only lasted for a day or an hour. And it normally doesn't last because there's old karma within us. Our unconscious mind comes forward and presents to us an unresolved issue. And when we do not meet it with love and awareness and wisdom, that unconscious energy, it starts to veil our awareness. We go back to sleep again. And so anywhere there's a shadow within us is where we are not awake. And if we are awake temporarily, <laughs> the shadow is the thing that will put us back to sleep. You know, the unconsciousness will put us back to sleep. And so it's very wise to do shadow work. It's very wise. You know, the very experience of spiritual awakening feels like it liberates our shadow. But more often than not, it doesn't. What happens is, is we transcend our unconsciousness. We open into a very spacious per perspective, a vast, free perspective. It's like stepping into another world. It's like stepping out of one dream and into quote unquote reality or you're seeing clearly. And you will see clearly everywhere <laughs> except within your shadow. Shadow can be a very powerful force. It's been many great spiritual teachers who've had huge shadows <laughs> and their teaching career ended terribly. They caused a lot of pain. But when we do our shadow work, our liberation work alongside our meditation practice. Now then these two are mutually supportive. When we do the liberating work of shadow work, we build the foundation for our awakening, you know, to take root in us in an abiding way, in an abiding way. And so it's so important, so important. And so, uh, you know, I could go on and on about the shadow, but I'm going to speak for it about uh, for about an hour and a half or so this coming Sunday at, at noon Mountain Standard Time. So you know, I'll speak more about that, but I'll, I'm going to answer some of these uh, this long list of questions I had tonight. And of course, if anyone has a question you want to ask in the chat, just bring it forward. Um, <clears throat> Here's a great question from Danny. Danny writes, uh, Craig, you often use the word love, such as loving your pain or loving the mountains. Can you describe what love is? Yeah, that's a great question. So when you come into your heart and you feel the intelligence of your heart, you will feel a luminosity, a radiance, and the intelligence of this luminosity and radiance is love. It embraces, it acknowledges, it's, it, 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 it's affectionate, it's intimate with life. So if you feel into the space of awareness, I wanna compare love to awareness, not that the two are really separate, but awareness can feel transcendent, it can feel spacious, it can feel detached, it can feel uh, like you are above. You know, sometimes with awareness, you're witnessing your life. You're witnessing others. So when someone walks in the room and you see them from the space of awareness, you might just see this person walking into the room. You might notice the colors they're wearing, the expression on their face. But when you see them with what I call loving awareness. You will see all that, which I just described, but you will also feel their presence. You will feel their divinity. You will feel close to them. 
you will be acknowledging their divinity. You may also acknowledge their pain. <laughs> but when your heart opens and is awake, there's this loving intelligence that moves through you. That moves through you. And a loving intelligence, it, it's, it's intimate with life. It feels things, it experiences things directly through oneness. Meaning there's no distance between you and what you're experiencing. No distance between you and your partner, you and the sky, you and the mountains. So say you're outside and you're in love with the mountains. You feel the hugeness of the mountains, the power, the strength. You, you begin to feel it in a non-dual way, in you, as you. And so love is compassionate, love is intelligent, love, it's, it's really different than like romantic love or, you know, emotional love, which is kind of gushy and clingy and attached. You know, true love is unattached, rat, but radically intimate. And that's kind of a paradox for most people. You know, when my heart first woke up, I found myself just falling in love about anything and everything <laughs> you know, my eyes came into contact with. You know, first, you fall in love fully with yourself. You fall in love with the sky and you feel its hugeness. You feel the hugeness of the sky in you as you. You feel the hugeness, the aliveness of the ocean in you as you. As you're breathing, you're feeling just the waves of the ocean in you. When you see another, you see their beauty. Even if they're not, you know, conventionally uh, look like a, you know, 21-year-old model on the cover of Vogue magazine. So many times when I meet with people, I just see their beauty. Sometimes I have to bite my tongue because I don't want them to think that I'm <laughs> hitting on them by telling them how beautiful they are. You know, I have this uh, good friend, Chad, who's, who's with us this evening. When I see Chad, I feel the hugeness of his presence. You know, I feel this, this absolute love for him. You know, as if we've been friends for, for lifetimes. He makes me smile just by seeing him. And even if he, you know, walked into the room and was really angry, <laughs> you know, and I see him, I smile. You know, he's not, you know, he, it's not like a thing that he's walked in the room to me and showed me his anger, but just, he's a big fella. And uh, when I see him, my heart just is in love with him. You know, as I am in love with this moment right now, you feel this oneness, this unity. So this love has an intelligence, Danny. And so when we do shadow work, we're willing to love everything within us, even if it's difficult. The nature of love is that it, it walks in the direction of pain. It walks in the direction of anger. It's not afraid. It has a fearless quality to it. Emotional love has a <laughs> different kind of quality to it where it's like, oh, I like this, but I don't like that. And so it has like aversion to it and, and clinging. But true love, it doesn't care if, you know, you walk in the room and the person is angry. You look at them and you say, hey, <laughs> how are you? What's going on? You know, tell me what you're feeling. It's interested. It's curious. And so in order to do shadow work, we must be rooted in a place of awareness, which is detached and free and has a quality of equanimity. We also must be rooted in love, which is fearless and willing to see and feel and include, embrace even things that are difficult. So that's a great question, Daddy. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Um, here's one from Colleen. She writes, Craig, letting go of having a purpose has relieved me of suffering. Do we really need a purpose? Uh, that, that's a great question, Colleen. Um, we don't need a purpose 
but we all do have a purpose. <laughs> your purpose is your gift, sweetie. Your purpose is your gift. And so sometimes it's appropriate to be, to acknowledge your gift, to explore your gift, to get to know your gift, and to express your gift. There's also times, Colleen, when <laughs> we can do what Walt Whitman did, you know, which is just kind of sit in a grassy field and fall in love with the sky and have no purpose but just to love. <laughs> just to love there could be great freedom in having nothing to do nowhere to go nothing to be <laughs> you know and so there's great freedom in that but did god make you for a reason absolutely you know was it to get a great medal or to climb mount everest or you know to do this thing or that thing and not necessarily sometimes our purpose is to fall in love with ourself you know, for many of us who were born into a family that was abusive, our purpose is to fall in love with ourselves, to discover our divinity, our truth, <laughs> that there's something good here, there's something divine here. And once you've fallen in love with yourself, oftentimes you'll see that this gift is there within you. Some of us have the gift of listening. Some of us have the gift of <laughs> speaking. <laughs> some of us have the gift of both. Some of us have the gift of, you know, healing or teaching or sharing or accounting like even accounting is a tremendous gift it's one i do not have <laughs> and so accounting can be a gift you know it's like the gift of organization you know and so i encourage you uh to enjoy you know loafing and just you know being free with nothing to do, nowhere to go. But then, you know, when the moment is right, you may find now's the time to share. Now's the time to forgive. Now's the time to acknowledge or to be kind. And so thank you, Kali. Uh, All right, let's see here. Uh, this one's from Brett. Craig, my body feels fine, but I am getting a bit psychologically burned out from crying. The pain is burning up for months and months. I found that when I take a breath, the pain keeps coming up. How can I take care of myself? Oh, Brett, I'm going to encourage you to uh, do a little bit of what I was speaking to Colleen about. Give yourself permission to loaf. You know, if you live by the ocean, just go sit by the ocean and watch the waves go by. If you live in a freezing cold place, you know, sit by the fire and look out the window. You know, at the snowfall. At the snowfall. Give yourself permission to connect with the hugeness of the sky. And sometimes it's appropriate to take a break from the shadow work or to take a break from all the crying that we're doing. Sometimes it's good just to sip a cup of tea and to rediscover your divinity. You know, sometimes when we do shadow work or when we're doing healing work, we kind of get lost in the pain and the sadness and the grief. You know, I always tell people, first you start with the acknowledgement that you are divine, that you are good, that you are holy. That there is something that's pure here, Brett. Right here, right now. So you connect with this basic innocence. And then you do your healing work. And then when you're done doing your healing work, if you feel burnt out by it, you still connect with your divinity. You know, so instead of connecting with the pain body, at some point you put that down and then you just connect with your divinity. You stay connected with your divinity. If you stay connected to your divinity, you will not be burnt out. And so, Brett, you may need a little self-care time. You may need to go receive, you know, a massage, some body works, chiropractics, healing work, uh, you know, hang out in a bubble bath, go for a walk in the woods and nature. Uh, hell, for me, sometimes in the summertime, going on a dirt bike ride is just so... So healing, it's a great way for me just to let go of my day, you know, hop on a mountain bike, go for a ride, you know, go skiing, 
<laughs> do what you love, my friend. It's good to take a little break from all the, the healing work. Uh, sometimes we can, uh, we can get really overwhelmed by it. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I'm going to apologize in advance for all the questions that I received because I don't think I'm going to be able to get to all of them. Uh, hello, my friend. Uh, how to spot the difference between compassionate action that's informed by wisdom and idiot compassion. Yeah, so idiot compassion uh, normally is emotional in nature. And it, it arises because we do not have boundaries or uh, because we're emotionally attached to the outcome or we're emotionally attached to like pleasing. So true compassionate action arises from the wisdom of the heart. And so if you, you know, if you notice, okay, I have a choice of how to respond in life. Like say with forgiveness, if there's someone you need to forgive, uh, you know, I encourage you just to feel into your heart. You can see there's pain there. And you may know that, okay, I read the teachings of the Buddha. He said, I should be compassionate. Christ told me I should forgive. But this is a moment for you to ask your heart. How should I respond with compassion? How shall I forgive this person? And if you listen to the quiet voice in the center of your heart, you know, the quietest voice within your consciousness, not the loudest, the loudest is the idiot compassion that will rush off to save someone who doesn't want to be saved or to please someone who doesn't want to be pleased. But if you listen to the quietest voice within you, Catherine, what you'll discover is there's an intelligence there. And that intelligence may say something like, I need to forgive my mother or father. But I can forgive them right here. I don't need to go, you know, into their house and have a group hug. I don't need to talk about it and process with them. You know, we don't need to process our emotions with a narcissist. That, <laughs> that, that's not healing for you, and it's actually not healing for them. It's confusing for them. You know, so you, you do your healing work at home on your own. You forgive them from afar. Sometimes compassionate action means we bite our tongue. Sometimes it means we speak up. But if the movement is to speak up, is it coming from truth? Is it coming from wisdom? Wisdom has the feeling of power to it. It'll be a gentle power. Emotional power is more clingy and pushy and assertive and aggressive. So emotional wisdom, you know, will be assertive. Like, I think I know what this person needs to hear. We go give them an earful of that which they don't want to hear. And then they don't listen and they argue back. That's idiot compassion. That's idiot wisdom. True wisdom will say the right thing at the right time. It'll feel just like this flow moving through you. It'll feel light. It will feel gentle. It will feel free. Free. And come with a power. You know, idiot compassion comes with clinginess and wanting to save the day or to be a hero or to fix something with someone who doesn't want to be fixed. Idiot compassion normally doesn't work. True compassion, true compassion is much more powerful than we acknowledge. Sometimes I'll just say something to someone, it'll just like come out of me. And even in my you know consciousness, I'll be like, oh my gosh, why did I say that? And it might be a year later that the person comes back and says, hey, thank you for saying that. And I'll say, oh, good. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad that wasn't the wrong thing to say. You know, at the time it, it felt wrong, you know, to my ego, but to the truth in me, it just spoke. It couldn't be stopped. So that's a beautiful question. Okay. Here's another question. Craig, I managed to do a lot of openings. Is Craig, I managed to do a lot of openings as far as giving is concerned only realizing recently that I still tend to be uncomfortable when it comes to receiving. Yet you often suggest opening to God's grace. 
And I associate it to vulnerability and surrender. Yes, if, if you want to open to God's grace, it's associated with vulnerability and surrender. I tend to notice that fears prevent my heart from opening fully to the divine grace, whether during meditation or whether during socializing. Also fully aware that one can't truly, uh, can't be giving when we're unable to receive unconditionally. Uh, that's a great question, Chris. And so basically, you know, Chris is saying she's good at giving, but she has a shadow around receiving. And so she's bringing this, bringing this into the light. So with, with receiving, oftentimes we're unwilling to receive because we're scared, uh, because we feel unworthy, because we've been hurt by people close to us. And so there's this fear of being vulnerable. There's this fear of being open. And you have to remember, who are you opening to? In regards to God, you're opening to the love and the intelligence of the universe. <laughs> you're opening to the most high compassion. And so in order to, to receive, it's good if you learn to self-soothe first. Because a lot of us in our cellular memory, at memory, we have trauma. And within our trauma body, uh, We've kind of trained ourselves to unconsciously shut down. When you self-soothe, when you breathe in a sense of love, when you hold your heart, you hold your belly, when you take deep, full breaths while fear arises, and you just say, you know, just a gentle mantra like, relax, it's okay, relax, I'm here, relax, I'm opening to love. When you self-soothe, you help calm your, your egoic nervous system and you start receiving your love. When you can receive your love, <laughs> it's easier to receive God's grace, you know, because you start to build this, this avenue of trust. And it's easier to receive from others in social situations. And so if you have any trauma in your body, if you've been hurt, if you've been abused, it can be helpful to do some healing, uh, like some somatic healing work with a therapist or counselor or body worker. And of course, you know, I always encourage individuals to do this with themselves. So often we've been hurt in this world and we unconsciously shut down. And this is a shadow. We unconsciously shut down and then we're unable to receive that which is greater. So many people have been hurt um, by the Catholic Church, or what, like what, what a good Christian said to them one day, in a judgmental tone, and so they close the door between them and Christ, between them and God, between them and Buddha nature. You don't need to do that. You know, if there was someone at church who was grumpy or mean to you, <laughs> that's a human being grumpy or mean. You don't need to shut down for the rest of your life and blame Jesus. I encourage you to open your heart and see that Christ loves you. See, the Divine Mother loves you. And so I encourage you to take a deep breath and just open your subtle energetic body. And if you have trouble opening, you might have to take a hundred deep breaths <laughs> and start to trust. That's a great question. Okay, this one's from Morton. Craig, it'd be nice if you, if you could elaborate on what it means to be humble and how do we encourage this as an attitude in our daily life practice. How do we stop the excessive need to know, to control, to figure out within our minds? What facilitates this opening to a humble mind and heart? Oh, Morton, so I'm going to give you the exact same answer I gave um, uh, to Chris, you know, before you. Uh, it has to do with uh, a willingness to surrender, to be vulnerable. And if there's any struggle, if, there, if your mind is anxious and always wanting to know, it's telling you, I'm not at ease. The quickest way to make the mind at ease is to soothe the body, to soothe your subtle energetic nervous system. Our minds are anxious, not because there's something we need to know immediately. Our, our minds are anxious because there's fear in the body. When you soothe the body, when you meet it with love, this is a radical act of humility. 
And if you want to live in an awakened way, you must master this. You must master humility. <laughs> you must be good. You know, the awakened consciousness is humble. It's not arrogant. And so when you give yourself permission to be soft, to be gentle, to not know, but rather to trust, and you deepen in humility. And you can ask, like, is there anything I need to absolutely know in this moment? Probably not. Am I safe right here, right now? Probably yes. If you feel into reality, reality is very safe. 99.9% .9 of the time. It's only occasionally that danger comes forward. And so when we do healing work, when we do trauma work, you know, this is a radical act of humility and love. And you begin to trust that it's okay to be open all the time. Okay, let me just check here. Uh, uh, okay, this one is from, I'm having trouble pronouncing your name, but maybe it's Keshav. Hi, Craig, is shadow work similar to catharsis? I have been doing catharsis, like inviting crying and laughter and anger on the surface to release them in a safe space. I've begun doing it for years. And I still feel blockages, suffocation in my heart. Um, yes, my friend, a shadow work, uh, shadow work requires the willingness to look at everything within us. And so catharsis is the act of letting go of the old pain within us. And so if there's more blockages within you, my friend, it just means that there's more work to do. But don't be, uh, don't be discouraged. I want you to imagine that this is the most loving and healing work uh, that you can do. It's the most loving, healing work you can do for yourself. And when you're doing it for yourself, you're actually doing it for the collective consciousness and for the planet as well. So you keep up the good work, my friend. Uh, okay, let's see. Um, yes, yes. So love is allowing ourselves to see and to feel everything within us. It absolutely is. It's the source of everything on planet Earth. Yeah, so someone wrote that in. So thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, let's see. Um, what other... Um, uh, what other, what other uh, questions do we have here? Okay, here's one. Craig... My question is, how do you live in a way in the urban world with various social conventions and a culture that seems to be built around distracting oneself uh, from the truth? There's an underlying fear of acting out too, too, uh, with, with too much emotion or letting go too much. Yeah, this is true that, that in the dream world, you know, people try to keep it all together, my friend. But this is, you know, if you're come if you've come to this class, we're stepping out of the dream, we're stepping into the truth. And so I encourage you to feel everything within you. You know, so you know, this person goes on to write, uh, I've been repressing the full experience of existential terror and bliss because of this fear you know, being seen, you know, experiencing this publicly, then it seems like I'm living in separation, not fully realizing my humanity. Yeah, you have to give yourself to be naked and vulnerable. You know, when I, I went to uh, to a Catholic Mass this morning with my family, and back, you know, in the back of the church, there's these big stained glass windows, and there's, you know, there's this uh, a stained glass, you know, picture of Jesus and Mary, and both of them, you know, have this naked heart. And they they have their finger just, like, you know, just like pointing to, toward their heart. They're naked. They're vulnerable. Vulnerable. They're open. They're willing to see, to feel, to experience. They're not hiding. And this is the way forward, my friend. I can remember when I was going through my divorce, I was a train wreck publicly. People would ask me how I was doing, and I would just openly cry. 
would cry at the checkout line when someone would say, how's your day going? You know, <laughs> I would just burst into tears. I didn't hold anything back. You know, there's times, you know, when I'd be driving down the road, you know, you know, with my family, my daughter would look at me, she'd say, dad, are you okay? And I'd be like white knuckled and be having existential fear, just like racing through my body. I say, yes, yeah, sweetie, I'm doing okay. Daddy's just having a lot of feeling move through his body right now. <laughs> she'd smile and, you know, and I'd hold her hand and she'd show her that I was okay. You know, human beings have big hearts and we're capable of experiencing so much. But, you know, traditionally speaking, most of us try to keep it all zipped up and all like wrapped up inside like, if we let someone see our tears, you know, people imagine that they're going to get fired from work or, I mean, what's the worst case? Someone's going to ask you, hey, how are you doing? Are you okay? <laughs> you know, you might have a conversation with someone you don't want to have a conversation with, but come on now. Your heart is bigger than you know. Give yourself permission to feel everything within you, whether it's existential fear, terror, or bliss. You know, there's been times when I feel like I've just come unhinged because so much bliss, so much euphoria was moving through my consciousness. So it's, it's good to be open. If you want to be awake, you have no walls within your consciousness. No walls. Okay, uh, let's see here. Here's another question. Hi, Craig. Nine years ago, I did a specific meditation practice. After this session, I discovered the divine. Beautiful. I spoke fluently, enjoyed life, and had uh, I had total oversight over the world. Okay, I think you mean you had vast spacious awareness. After the session, I also had uh, an extreme pain and then went into a psychotic episode. Spent seven months at a hospital and used medication now for nine years. The very aggressive thoughts um, I have, I have very aggressive thoughts to specific people in my family. Is there another way to handle this better? Because I feel like I've been treating this the wrong way. I do things every day that are uh, very damaging. I can see I need expert help. Uh, yeah, yeah, my friend. So sometimes when we have a very powerful experience during meditation. It can be disorienting. It can make our ego become a little bit unraveled. We can, we can go into psychosis and things can get really strange. It's important to get some expert help. Uh, but let's look at expert help. When you see a psychologist, if you tell them you had this profound transcendental experience during meditation, they might think you're psychotic or making something up. So it's good to meet with someone who knows your experience, the truth of it, and also understands psychology. And so this could be helpful to, to meet with an expert who knows both, not one or the other, because you know, we can get terrible advice from someone who's just schooled in spirituality. You know, we need someone who's balanced, who understands our humanity and our divinity. So that's a very, very good question. Okay, let's see if I can do one last question here real quick. Craig, it feels like I've been destructive in my life for many years. This includes my health and relationships. Uh, I'm searching for a way out. Uh, I'm pleased to know that maybe uh, someone could help, that I could, uh, you know, walk this path and heal. Yes, it's true, my friend. All of us can heal. All of us can heal on this path. So many of us have been destructive, have made terrible choices. You know, I went to Catholic Mass once with my mother, and the priest said, you know, this is a place for <laughs> a place for second chances, you know, sometimes third chances or tenth chances or one hundredth chances. This is the spiritual path. On the path, we have millions of chances to heal and to grow, to change. And so I encourage you to never, never give up, never lose faith. You know, all of us here came into this world divine, but then found ourselves very quickly confused or lost. And so, you know, don't think you're alone, my friend. Don't think you're alone.
So thank you all uh, for showing up. Uh, thank you all for the generous donations. Uh, I look forward to seeing you, uh, some of you Wednesday night, you know, the, uh, for my meditation group, 7 p.m. Uh, please join us there if you want to go deeper and spend some time, you know, receiving this grace and this transmission. And like I said, next Sunday night, the 10th, I will not be uh, doing this class, but I will be doing a two-hour class uh, Sunday the 10th at 12 p.m. Mountain Time. Details for everything are on my website. Uh, so much love to you all. It's been uh, an absolute pleasure and joy to be with you all. Peace be with you all, and, uh, and good night. Good night.